Hello, my name is Ray Hughes, and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project uh, conducted by the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And today's date is the 9th of May, 2018. And this interview is going to be conducted here at the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library, locally conducted by Brian Powers, who happens to be our cameraman today. And today we have the honor and privilege of interviewing a World War II veteran, Milton J. Oakham. And uh, Mr. Oakham, it's a pleasure to meet you. And is it all right just to call you Milt? Thank you, Ray. Is it okay just to call yes, you Milt? Yes, uh -huh. oh, Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, Milt, if you would, uh, where were you born in the date of your birth? I was born in Price Hill, or, well, I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio probably at uh, the hospital, but uh, I, at that time I lived in Elbron Avenue, 566 Elbron in Price Hill. And the date? And I went to Whittier uh, School over in Price Hill, and then I went to uh, Western Hills, graduated in 1944. I see. And I was on a uh, track team, cross country, uh, was mostly what I did in Western Hills High School. What was the date of your birth? Unbelievable, but it was April the 1st, 1926, You're April, April Fool's Day. April Fool's Day, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, what were your parents' names, uh, Milt? Uh, my mother's name was Sarah, with an H, and my dad's name was Dave, David, and they called him Dave Oakham. Oakham. And what was your mother's maiden name? Do you remember that? Uh, Brakeman, B-R-A-C-H-M-A-N. I see. Now, uh, what did your father do for a living, Milt? Oh, my dad was a peddler. He used to have uh, pedal fruit and vegetables with a horse and wagon at first, and then he had a, a fruit store in Cheviot on Glenmore Avenue for about 25 or 30 years with uh, Paul Krauser Meat Market, they shared half the building together. Uh -huh. And um, did your mother work? Yeah, she helped him at the fruit store. I see. And what about brothers and sisters? I had a brother, Lee, they called him, his name was Leo. Uh, he was a pharmacist and he was a uh, down at Shapiro Drugs down on in the uh, uh, Netherland Plaza and one in the Terrace Plaza uh, downtown. He was a uh, druggist down there, I managed the, the drug stores. I then see. he had a drug store in Hyde Park of his own. And then he had a prescription place on Highland Avenue years later. Uh -huh. And uh, any other brothers and sisters? I had a sister, Peggy, and uh, she was married to a doctor. And her name was Katz, K-A-T-Z. Aaron Katz was her husband. She just passed away about a year ago. I see. Um, I think uh, in talking with you earlier, you said your, your folks immigrated to the United States from Kiev in yes. the Ukraine. Uh, as far as I could remember, it was, uh, Kiev was part of, I thought Russia, but it's, yes. you say Ukraine. It's, uh, Kiev, the USSR, yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Russia, Whatever. I'm sorry. I wasn't born yet, but right. as far as I can remember. And was that your grandparents that came to this country? or? or? Uh, well, my uh, mother's mother came from England. She was married to a lord over there. And I was supposed to be a duke. <laughs> I never got that recognition. But anyway, uh, Her name was, we called her Bubba, but her name was uh, Brakeman. Yes. And Anna Brakeman. Yeah. Anna, that was your grandmother, huh? uh -huh. your mother's side. Yeah. Did you know your dad's parents? Uh, I don't recall them. I was too young when they lived on the third floor on Elbron, but they, uh, uh, I remember, uh, I was told he taught the Yiddish to school children. I see. He was like a, a school teacher, you know. Uh -huh. 
So some of your heritage is Jewish. Uh -huh. uh, uh, and um, what church did you folk go to when you were youngster? We went to uh, a Price Hill. It was called Beth Jacob. It's not there anymore, but uh, we used to go there. Uh, and then we went to uh, one in Roselawn. I can't remember the name of it now, but uh, what is it? We didn't go there very often. Uh -huh. That's going back years ago. When you were a youngster, uh, did you have any part-time jobs or full-time jobs? All the time, yeah. I started out uh, was selling the uh, Ladies' Home Journal and True, True something magazine. True Detectives. It's a magazine. Uh, the subscriptions, the neighborhood, and then I'd sell Christmas cards, and I cut grass, and I'd have a lemonade stand when people would go to uh, Moneco on uh, weekends. They'd have music down there, and, they, and I'd have lemonade stand out in front, and we'd uh, and lemonade and so. Uh -huh. You know, trying to make a living, trying to make a couple extra bucks. Always, yeah. Always, yeah. Uh, as, as a young man, uh, do you remember Pearl Harbor Day, December the 7th, 1941? Yeah, I remember seeing it on the, on the news, yeah. yeah. Do you recall what you were doing when you found out about it? Uh, it's hard to remember. I don't, don't recall. That was in 41, I don't recall. Mm -hmm. But uh, I do remember, I think I was coming home from school when I heard about it. Uh -huh. And um, we all, neighborhood boys, decided to enlist, you know, but uh, couldn't get in because... Uh, well, you weren't old enough to enlist yet, you were still uh, quite think, young. Uh -huh, yeah, I, was, I think I was at 17 or 16, something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, I don't remember. Yeah. So, so uh, you went to uh, what high school was it? Western Hills. Western Hills. And you were on the uh, cross country team, I think you said? Yeah, cross country. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it was about three or four miles from my house on Elbrook. I used to run home from school for practice, and I'd usually uh, uh, in the morning get there before school started and run the track about three or four times to warm up. Uh, that's all I can remember. But Did they give you letters in those days? For yeah, I, I have uh, uh, letters from the track team. Uh -huh. Cross country, yeah. yeah. Um, so you graduated from high school? In 44, I think it was. In 1944, uh -huh. around June of 44. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Did you want to go into the military uh, right away, or what was it? Well, your... I tried to enlist in the uh, Air Corps because my brother was in that, and they wouldn't take me. And I tried the Marines and the Navy. They wouldn't take me because I was colorblind. I see. And then uh, I got a, a letter from the president saying, you're, congratulations, you're drafted. <laughs> you know? And they <laughs> sent me to Fort Thomas. Now that was in... Uh, Kentucky. That was in uh, uh, October of, uh, of 1944 that you got your draft notice? Probably, uh, yeah. yeah. And you went to Fort Thomas, you said? Fort Thomas, Kentucky. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, then they sent us down to uh, Fort McClellan, Alabama for basic training. I see. And while I was in basic training, uh, we were on a 20, uh, I think it was like a 20 mile maneuver. And it snowed that night and my feet got turned black in the morning, and I, they wanted to send me to the hospital because I had 
uh, what they called uh, frostbite or trench foot uh -huh. at the time. And I refused it. I didn't want to leave my friends, so I stayed in. And then we were sent to, uh, I think it was Fort Dix, and then we went over in U-boats or in a convoy to, to uh, Camp Chaffee in France called Camp Lucky, Camp Lucky Strike. At La Havre, France. La Havre, France, yeah. yeah. How long, uh, let me just back up a second. Though. How long were you in basic training down there at Fort McClellan? Uh, six weeks, I think. Six weeks? Uh -huh. They didn't give you very much training, did they? Well, they needed bodies over there. Uh, they didn't give you too much time, no. Yeah. Um, you mentioned you were uh, trained to be a medic. Why was that? Well, were you uh, I was starting to go, I was, uh, before I went into service, I was going to UC uh, in pre-med. And I was in pre-med for a very short time, maybe less than eight weeks. And uh, I didn't have my chemistry. I never taken chemistry in high school, so I had to go at night school, uh, take chemistry, and then go back and try to do my pre-med. In the meantime, uh, when they got me drafted, they said, oh, you were in med, we're gonna put you in the medics. And they gave me an eight hour training course, I think it was eight hours, so they got how to do uh, uh, insulin and uh, drugs, and how to stop bleeding with a tourniquet. And, uh, that was my, uh, they said, well, we're going to put you in the medics. That's how I got in the medics. I see. And when we got overseas, I had that Red Cross band on me, and the, they were shooting at me. And I said, I need a gun. And they said, You don't get a gun with the band on it. I took it off and I joined the outfit. Uh, they put me in infantry. That was in, uh, I joined it in a place called Mannheim, Germany. Uh, uh, that's that's when they gave me the rifle and put me in the front line. <laughs> yeah, and so you joined at that time the 324th Infantry Regiment. Uh huh. And that was part of the 44th Infantry Division. Uh, yeah, Easy Company called E Company. E Easy Company, huh? Right. It wasn't it wasn't as easy as you could have thought to? I would imagine. Uh, well, at that time, you you know, when you're young, you don't know any different. Yeah. So. You landed uh, when you went over on a convoy. You went over on a. You remember the ship you went over on? It was a. You. It was a. Uh, uh, it was about fifty foot waves. I remember that, and I think it was sometime around April. Well, I remember going down to the kitchen to get something, and uh, everybody was getting their shots, and they were getting sick for going up and down, and getting seasick, and. Uh, I went up on the top deck and the guy said, oh, we got 50 foot waves here. I said, boy, it feels good to be out in the air anyway. I was hanging on and um, that's all I can remember. We ended up in La Havre. La Havre. Uh, I think it was called Camp Lucky Strike. Right. Yeah, so, uh, and at that point you're still a medic. Yeah. Yeah. And Supposedly. Yeah, and where did you go from there from La Havre? Well, we got on these trains, they were called 40 and 8s, and we were headed up towards Belgium, and they blew a bridge out, and they backed us up, took us back in through, I think, through Luxembourg into Mannheim, and that's how we got into uh, our outfit, was the 44th. I see. Now, you were, uh, were you in combat at the time you were a medic? And they were shooting at you? At, uh... A couple of days. Huh? Yeah, a couple of times, yeah. yeah. That's how I decided I needed a gun. And I took the Band-Aid, the Red Cross band off, and they gave me an M1 rifle. And that's when you, uh, that's when you joined uh, the 324th. Right, Yeah. that's when I got in Easy Company. Yeah, well tell us about your experiences with Easy Company and the places you were at. Oh gosh, hard to remember, but uh, 
a big place I remember. We went through Heidelberg. I was sitting on the back of a tank. Uh, we didn't have any shooting or nothing there. They didn't bomb it or nothing. And then we went down to a place in a town called Oy Oy. And I stopped at General Field Marshal Rommel's summer home. And how, Oy, you say? Oy. Oy. And that's where? Name of the German yeah. town, I think. Uh huh. And uh, while we was there, uh, he wasn't there, but uh, we did uh, go through his scrapbook, and I had a lot of pictures, which I had showed you. Uh, I took out of his album, sent it home to show some of the things that were going on. Did you send the album home itself? Just the pictures. Just uh, send it back. Uh, you mean family. pictures that you took, or no? I took them out of Rommel's. Oh, you sent scrapbook. the original pictures home, huh? Uh huh. Oh, I yeah, just... I still, and I had I had his uh, passport to Austria, which I still have. Uh, we have it in a lockbox. Yeah, uh, Rommel's passport to Austria. Oh boy. You know which, and I had his P thirty eight pistol for a while, it had adjustable sights on it. And I took my M1 rifle in the morning and I saw a deer there and I shot at it and missed. So I took his P38 and we nailed it and we brought it back in and we put it on a spit and rotisserie, we had fresh meat. It was at Ramos' home there at Oi. Oh, yeah. yeah, I remember that. And then we went down to, uh, uh, we went south and ended up in uh, across the uh, to Austria, a place called Landeck, Austria. It was in the Tyrol Mountains, and there was this big schoolhouse. And a lot of the fellows were going in the schoolhouse, and they were getting skis, and they were sledding on. There was snow there, and they were skiing down the slope. Uh, I didn't do that, but. Uh, I watched them, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the uh, German kids who were still in their teens, 12, 14, 16, were still shooting at some of the guys. They hadn't figured the war was over yet. Mm -hmm. They were, you know, up in the hills and they haven't heard the war was over. But they had took all of our live ammo away from us at that time. I see. And, uh, we uh, had, uh, I'm trying to remember, I had uh, our commander of the outfit there. They Anderson. needed an interpreter. And I, I became his interpreter because I could speak what I thought sounded German. It was Yiddish. And uh, most of the time they'd rattle off so fast. Uh, he'd say, what are they saying? I said, nothing important. You know, that, that's it. But I got out of KP and guard duty. <laughs> now you were interviewing, were these people that they had captured or? or? Well, these were people that came in to complain about something. I don't know, they talk so fast I didn't understand what they were saying. But uh, I did get a uh, three day pass to Paris while I was there uh, because of being in his, uh, office at that time came available and uh, we had uh, seen a lot of uh, beautiful women there and a lot of them were with these black soldiers and they said they were night fighters that's, yeah. that's they were in the army there and, but uh, that was part of my experience yeah uh, if we could, let's go back to um, to Ramos' home at at uh, Oi. Uh, did uh, you still have all those photographs that you took from the album? Yeah, the original pictures. Uh -huh. That's wonderful. Yeah, um, I made copies for you. So yeah, did you keep the uh, P thirty eight? I kept it for a while, and I had it in a safe when I had the store in Shiviet, and I was showing it different people, and. Uh, I had some stuff in there that uh, I guess I shouldn't have been bragging about, but I had a uh, ram's horn that I 
It was all engraved. It was from uh, back in the 11th century. And uh, I thought it was one of those things I used to blow at the temple called chauffeur, you know. And uh, then I had uh, uh, these things I had gotten. Uh, there was a big place in a city called Bitch, B-I-T-C-H-E, in Germany. And they had this big mountain. And inside the mountain had all these things that the Germans had confiscated from uh, France and Russia and different from places. From Jewish families. And they had, they had uh, uh, like these horses uh, with knights on top. And I had taken a sword from one of them. I carried it for about two or three days and I ended up throwing it in a ditch. It was too much to carry with my backpack and everything. But uh, they did they did have pictures of uh, Rembrandt and Van Gogh. And some of my fellows were taking their knife and they were cutting them out of the frame, putting them in their, in their, in their uh, jackets and, and taking them home, you know. Uh, where was that at when when you saw all those? Uh, was that at Bitch? The city was called Bitch. I remember that because I had a cousin came up in a jeep and visited me uh -huh. at that time, and uh, I can't remember his name now. But uh, his mother was friends of my mother. You know. Yeah. Did you get any uh, any paintings yourself? Did I get any what? Uh, any of the paintings? No, uh, I didn't have enough sense to. Yeah. I wish I had. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, well, you know, uh, while you were at uh, Rommel's house there at Oi, you said there were uh, Jewish bodies there that had been... Uh, it, it was, uh, the pictures of the bodies were in his album, but the, oh. they, they were, you could tell that was the back of it. His his uh, home, you know where they were stacked up. Is that right? Yeah. That must they must have uh, done that after uh, when Rama wasn't alive anymore or something. Probably not, because he had committed suicide. I understand. Yeah. And uh, they had uh, so gave they were, him to save his family. Right. So they were actually killing Jews there at in Oi. I think so, yeah. Yeah. It's a terrible... Yeah. That's what I heard after the war. Yeah, it would be a terrible thing to witness, but... Uh, um, so, um, how long did you stay there at Rommel's place? Uh, we stayed there, I think, two days. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a cow in the barn, and we milked the cow and had fresh milk. And we had the deer meat, so we we were elated. We had, mm -hmm. you know, we got out of eating K rations. Yeah. yeah. Did you uh, have you stayed in touch with anybody that you served with there? Amen. Well, we used to have uh, reunions, and I went to a couple of reunions. The last one I went to was in Indianapolis. That's been about ten years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but they they send me a newsletter all the time, and, and different things that uh, some of their uh, next of kin have been carrying on the uh, group. Yeah, you know, which is pretty good. They ever have any reunions around this area anymore? They haven't had any lately. I went to one in uh, Kentucky. Was at the Round Towner. Yes. One time, uh, got to see three or four people that I knew. There was one fellow that he and uh, another fellow befriended me during the war. Well, his name was Charlie Adler. And uh, he had, uh, when I first met him, he had a uh, money belt on and he had all these uncut diamonds in it that he had gotten from a safe that they blew up at a jewelry store, you know, and he, got those, when we have stripped down inspections where you had to take all your clothes off, he would bury that belt in the sand or the dirt and then get it back up when they leave, you know. 
But he got that home. And years later, I understand uh, his name was Adler, Charlie Adler. Uh, and he bought a restaurant down in Miami Beach on, I think it was on Washington and 14th Street. Uh, that, uh, that I didn't uh, see him, but I went in there one time after after the war, and uh, I don't know if he was still living or not. But uh, my uncle had a, a restaurant in Miami Beach called Wolfie's, and uh, I didn't go down there with my uh, time to go. About. We go down there in the winter time and stay with my uncle and uh, aunt. And uh, I went over to see that restaurant that Charlie Adder bought. And the other guy's name was Paul Montefello, and he lived in Indiana. And I read in a newsletter he had passed away several years ago. Well, uh, which safe did they blow? Where were they at when they blew a safe to get the- I have no idea. They, they hid that before I got there. Okay. And- uh, Yeah, one of, the, one of the towns that they, Got that in, and uh, yeah, he had plenty. But he had a, a belt full of uncut diamonds. Huh? Had, yeah, I dumb enough. I should have asked for one of them, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Could have used it when I got married. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you that, Go ahead. That's that's all I can remember. I'm trying to look back. It's hard to remember stuff that's been you know, seventy years ago. Oh, you didn't tell me, though, what happened to the P-38. Oh, well, I hid that in my safe and showed it in the store. And I went to work one day, and uh, it was raining. And uh, somebody had broken in the back door uh, in the warehouse and took the whole safe. And I had a P-38 in there, and I had that ram's horn and I had some gold bars that I bought uh, in Hong Kong where we were there. I think it was Hong Kong, someplace overseas. And that was all gone. Mm. Wow. Yeah. What a treasure that is. And I had a bunch of, I had, a, I had some 25 pistols I brought back from the war, 22, a 32 pistol. That I brought back, and then that Rommel's pistol that was one of my treasures, and that was gone. Yeah, that's tragic. Uh, I think it was a guy that worked for me. Uh, I'm trying to remember his name now. Uh, he was into buying and selling silver, and he always would be short of money and selling my furniture without me knowing about it. Mm. You know. Mm. Anyway, the lady. Uh, Mrs. Beakey that owned the bowling alley behind my building, the warehouse, uh, she said she saw two cars and they, uh, the morning the safe was gone, she saw them open up a door and drop something. She thought they put a television in somebody's trunk. Mm, that was your safe. It was my yeah. safe, yeah. Yeah, what a trade. We never did find it. Yeah. Um, so, I think you told me that uh, another town that you were in in Europe was Rothenburg. Yeah. Do you recall that? Uh, no, I don't remember that, but I know it was there, but I, uh -huh. I don't remember too much about that. But we were there, our outfit was there. Mm hmm Yeah. Uh, we were... Uh, That's quite a famous city in uh, Bavaria there. I guess so. Yeah. I don't remember too much about that. Uh, um, what other towns do you recall being in? Uh, just that town in called Bitch. That was that was this big mountain, and then they had those big doors that they opened up, and then you go in there, and they had all these treasures that, inside. Uh, Did you see all the paintings yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was dumb enough not to take something like yeah. I grabbed a sword off of one of the guys on horseback and yeah. I carried that for a while and yeah. threw it away. Yeah. Uh, what other uh, villages or towns do you recall? Oh, 
Well, I remember the big castle we were in the day the war ended in Landeck, Austria. Uh, we were in this big building and uh, after the war, uh, years later, I got a chance to go back, retrace my steps, and uh, they had made that castle into apartment buildings. And people were hanging out of like bamboo poles or clothes to dry. Mm. Uh, when this, uh, and that's at Landick. Is that, Landick. In, is that in Austria? Austria, it's called Tyrol. T-I-R-O-L, I think it was. Tyrol Mountains or whatever. Uh -huh. Yeah. And you were there on when the uh, war ended on May the 8th of 45, I guess? Yeah. Were, uh, were you, um, do you recall when they tried to assassinate Hitler while you were overseas? No, I don't remember that, but I read about it after the war, you know. yeah. Uh, I don't recall, but I think uh, I'm trying to remember, uh, it was a town in, called Mannheim mm -hmm. that I was in that I remember going to a, uh, they had like a, a wailing wall like they have in Israel mm -hmm. there. I went there and then I went, they had what they call a big, uh, like a whirlpool that's in the ground and they call it a mikveh. And that's where the women would go before they got married and get cleansed. Uh -huh. I remember that. Uh, we were there only a couple of days, maybe three days. Uh, that was called Mannheim. Mm -hmm. And so from, uh, from that uh, castle in the Tyro Mountains, where did you go? Well, I'm trying to remember, uh, from uh, Austria, you mean, in uh -huh. Tyrol? Uh, well, the war, I think, was over, and they sent us back to, uh, I did get a trip to Paris, I told you, and uh, like a pass for a weekend. Uh, then we went to uh, a brothel called uh, Red Light District. It was. Did you? I'm trying to remember the name of the place. Uh, did you go to the uh, Crazy Horse while you were there? What was the name of it? Crazy Horse, no. or uh, Moulin Rouge, or Moulin Rouge sounds familiar. Yeah. Uh, but another I'm trying to think of the name of the place. And you say it was a brothel. Yeah. Uh huh. For sure. Now, that's where uh, we trade cigarettes and, and soap for sex, mm -hmm. supposedly. We were kids, we didn't know what, what we were doing anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so you, were, you stayed there in Paris for uh, three days? About two or three days. Yeah. Um, so you could use cigarettes for like currency while you were there, huh? It yeah. was the same as having money, wasn't it? Oh, better than money. American cigarettes. Yeah. Yeah. And and the uh, chewing gum and the soap was good barter, if I remember. There were a lot of American GIs there in Paris at the time when you were there? Yeah, quite a few. Uh, Where did you stay at while you were in Paris? Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the place. It was uh, like a rooming house. Uh -huh. uh, didn't have nothing but a room, you know. Uh, most of the stuff that we, uh, for food and everything, we, we traded cigarettes and candy and chewing gum and soap. Mm -hmm. You know, that was better than money then. Uh, After your uh, 
Not off. I can't remember the name of that place. After your three-day visit to Paris, where did, did you go back? Where did you go back to? Back, back to Austria, Tyrol, and um, I was, like I told you, I, I was the interpreter, so I didn't have to do any KP or guard duty. And um, it's called merchandising. Merchandising, that's right. That's what I called it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, anyway, that's I'm trying to remember anything else that went on. So where did you go from there? Where was your next stop? Uh, oh, then we were, we had a big ceremony uh, by the Brenner Passes where we went into Austria. Uh, and then we had the ceremony at the end of the war. And then they bust us back to uh, England. I think it was uh, Southampton. We saw Bob Hope do a show for us uh, with uh, Marilyn, Mar Marlene Diedrich at mm -hmm. the time. And uh, then we got put on the Queen Elizabeth, the boat, there was all, our whole division, which was about 17,000, was on that boat. And we had a we got back in about four and a half days, and uh, I got a picture. Hit a uh, fellow take a picture of me going past the Statue of Liberty, on, and we, I was, he took a picture of me going waving at the. At the statue. You know, uh huh. I still have that somewhere. Uh, but uh, we came back on a. Took us more than two weeks to get over there, but we came back in four and a half days on that big boat. Wow. Quite a trip, Quite. and then uh, they sent me to uh, San Antonio because uh, I didn't have enough points to get out, uh, and I worked there in San Antonio doing uh, uh, final orientations for the veterans getting discharged, and doing. Uh, Typing, because I'd taken typing in school, so I did that part time, and uh, then I went back Cincinnati on a couple. Uh, I was bartending at night at the officers' club. I got the bartender. I got fifty cents a night, and all you could drink when I didn't drink. But anyway, uh, some of the officers there gave me. Uh, travel vouchers to take the ones that re-enlisted, some of the uh, high officers re-enlisted, and I used to take them up to uh, New Jersey, and I think it was Fort Dix, uh, and then on the way back I stopped in Cincinnati, and uh, one time I ended up buying a, a car and driving it down to uh, San Antonio, and the first night I stopped in Kentucky, a small town. Uh, anyway, somebody broke in my car, took all my luggage. But uh, anyway, I did, uh, I had this car, it was like a 35 gram or something, and doors open in the front, going suicide, suicide doors. Yeah, yeah, suicide doors. That's, That's what they called them. Yeah. And, uh, Anyway, uh, that was about it. I stayed in San Antonio for quite a while. I guess I was there for about three or four months altogether. Uh, then I got some of those trips to go back up north and stop at home. Uh, but uh, when you're a bartender down there, the officers at the club had their name on their their own bottle and then you just pour a drink for them. And they come in with their dates and uh, usually they give you a nickel or a dime tip. Mm -hmm. That was a uh, way of making some money at the time. Sure, yeah. But you got to eat in the, in the restaurant there, the kitchen if you wanted. Yeah. That was a big benefit at the time. Sure. 
Sure. At the, so you were there until uh, until April of well, let's see, until uh, April of uh, forty six then. Something That's, like that. You yeah. got discharged. Uh, so you had your uh, birthday, your twentieth birthday. I can't remember, but I was. Uh, you were born in nineteen twenty six, so you yeah, were twenty years was. old. Okay, yeah. And 46. Yeah, I don't, uh, yeah, because I was about 21 when I came, got out of the army, I think. Yeah, um, I show that you were discharged on April the 22nd of 46. Is that about right? That sounds about right. Yeah, so you were still, tw you just turned 20 years old. Yeah, I guess it was. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think I was 21 then, wasn't I? April, I was, April 1st was my birthday. Right. So I think I just turned. 21, wasn't it? Okay. Um, well, I show that... <clears throat> Maybe I'm confused on it. I don't remember. You, 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 you got discharged in 1946, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, well, you would have been 20 years old, I think. I guess so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You were born in 26, so... Okay. Um, I don't remember. So, uh, so you left San Antonio and came back to Cincinnati? Yeah. And, um, you know, you, you show here that your highest rank was staff sergeant. Uh, what rank were you when you got discharged? PFC. How did you, get, how did you go from being a well, staff sergeant? I got sergeant? court martialed one time and they took that all away. Why did you get court martialed? Oh, uh, I told you I came out without a tie going to get my mail. And this non-com guy just came out of uh, OCS. OCS, yeah. yeah, and he stopped me and I mumbled something. He made me say what it, what what I thought in my mind, and I got court martial for it. I had to do uh, weekend latrine duty and clean the routine the routine there latrine with a toothbrush. Why Why did he get so upset? What did you say to him? Huh? When he asked you what you were thinking, what did you say to him? I told him what I thought, and I don't remember something like he was, I thought he was an asshole. And so he had you court martialed? Yeah. And busted back to private, huh? Yeah. Wow. And at that time, it wasn't anything important because it didn't pay any money for whatever. It got the money for the combat infantry badge. And to me, that was the most important part. That was the most important medal, actually. Yeah. Uh, infantrymen can have, I guess. It shows you were actually in combat. Yeah. And, but I, uh, I got to go to the uh, uh, memorial in Washington, D.C. this year. Oh, did you? Yeah. Got to see all the memorials. The, the honor the, flight. Honor flight, yeah. yeah. And. Uh, my nephew David, myself went up there and we got to see the Army Memorial, the Navy, all the Coast Guard, and all the different memorials, uh, Lincoln Memorial, and it was quite an impressive trip. Yeah. The whole day. And then everybody, uh, we got police escorts with the bus all around town and uh, got treated really great. And we came back. Uh, uh, they had the bagpipes and everybody shaking your hand. And right. It was quite an experience. At the airport, yeah. Um, what did you do when you first came home? I mean, you had to make a living, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Uh, at that time, I had... Uh, My dad had a fruit store on Glenmore and Cheviot, and I think there was, oh yeah, I bought, I bought the uh, fruit store in Warsaw. It was by Mrs. Lee, and Mr. Lee uh, passed away, and she sold me the fruit store on Warsaw between McPherson and Enright, and uh, I had the fruit store there for a while, and then I ended up, uh, on weekends, people had big bags of stuff that uh, restaurants would come, and I'd give them for a nickel, 
and uh, I saw a paper restaurant for sale in Walnut Hills called the Verona Dining Room on uh, Cross Lane on the Verona, uh, Cross Lane and Park Avenue, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And I made a deal, the lady that owned it wanted to sell it, and I bought the restaurant. And I had that, I bring all my vegetables up there to her, uh, to the restaurant, so I wouldn't have any waste. And uh, then uh, at that time I was uh, married to my first wife, her name was Gloria, and she ran the restaurant. And uh, I would bring the vegetables up to her and everything, and then uh, we lived in a little a uh, place in the back of the restaurant. There was like a uh, restroom and behind that was a little room called a bedroom. And that's where we lived. Tell me about Gloria. When did you meet Gloria and what was her maiden name? Uh, her last name was at that time K-O-E-H-N-E Coney. And she was, uh, I had a uh, uh, a business that I was running called the Queen City Escort Service. And we furnished escorts at that time for people that wanted to go to the, you know, like Beverly Hills Lookout House and different uh, nightclubs at that time that were real popular. And they wanted, a lot of uh, people wanted an escort. But the reason I got into that uh, while well, I was at UC on a bulletin board where you get ads people put in, they wanted a couple of fellows to uh, escort some girls to prom. And I volunteered for that with a friend of mine, Billy Schwartz, and we started the escort service because they said this is a great thing. And that's how we got started in escort service. And then we ended up doing tours. They called it Tour Escort. And we had a big office uh, downtown on 4th Street that we rented. It belonged to this uh, fellow. We got it after he left at 4 o'clock. We would take over till at night. And we had a telephone answering service that answered our phone calls during the daytime. And we advertised in the uh, little brochure that was put out for conventions. Mm -hmm. And we gave tours, and we do uh, sightseeing tours. Uh, it took people in buses around Cincinnati, took them to up the incline, the Rookwood Pottery, and uh, took them to Mount Adams, Eden Park, uh, Alms Park, the uh, Conservatory of Flowers. We had a whole route of things we take these uh, people that came in town uh, and uh, we charge them like a dollar and a half, I think, for the tour. And then at the end of the day, they had a choice to go to Ivorydale to see uh, how soap and everything at Procter & Gamble was made, or fashion frocks, or go to the zoo. And then we... Uh, uh, then we hired uh, some of our uh, teachers at UC were part of the guides and the tours on the buses. And that was part of, uh, at that time. That what was, was Fashion Proc? Fashion Procs made dresses for women. Where was it located at? Uh, I'm trying to remember. Uh, In downtown Cincinnati? It was or? in Cincinnati somewhere, but oh. I never was there, but I, I was offered on the tour. Mm -hmm. Now, th this uh, escort service, what did you have? Uh, did you have young women that would take and be an escort for men or what? Yeah, uh, uh, women for men and men for women. Go, where, go, where did you get the... Uh, we advertised in, in the paper. And the young ladies would call you, or your young men would call you, and be an escort to someone? Uh-huh. And take them over to Beverly Hills and stuff like that, or what? they go with them. One time I had this fellow, uh, Butch Levine's brother, took this lady to, uh, she had a meter at the 
now the, uh, the terrace plaza in her room uh, in the lobby but she said come on up to the room and she had two guns strapped to her and he had to take her over to beverly beverly hills she says i'll i'll tell you when to leave and he got like uh, i think it was either 25 or 50 dollars for doing that it's a lot of money at that time yeah what was she carrying the guns for i don't know he never did tell me but she he was just worried why she had those you know, and, and her dress was open where she could get to her. She needed it. I'll be crazy. Yeah. How long did you have that escort service and uh, tour guide service? Uh, I had the escort service first, and then I branched it into the tour thing. And I had a 18 East 4th Street. I had an office, and I rented the office from uh, this fellow. He would leave at 4, and I'd take over at 4. And it's, that was my office, at, you know, I rented it from him. And uh, i call my telephone answering service, see if I had any calls to make or whatever. And uh, I interview the people that came in on the ads and whatever we do. But uh, my brother had uh, a pharmacy in the same building downstairs called Milo Pharmacy. He was a druggist at the time. Mm -hmm. So that, that was so. Uh, trying to remember, uh, anything interesting went on. Most of the time, uh, you know, the big gambling was across the river, wow. and uh, a lot of the uh, people that uh, wanted somebody to go with, they came in town, and they wanted somebody to show. Them where to go and they go to uh, sleep out Louis and Latin quarters and different lookout house, yeah. uh, Beverly Hills. Uh, gambling was a big thing then, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's about all I can remember. So what did you do after, how long did you stay in that business and then what did you do, do with your life? Well, like I told you, I got in the fruit and vegetable. Oh, wait a minute, I forgot to ask you. Uh, Gloria, uh, when, where did you meet her and how did you get, and when did you get married? I uh, met her. She applied for a job with the uh, escort service. Uh, we got married uh, shortly after that, about a year or two later. Uh, over in Kentucky somewhere, mm -hmm. the Justice of Peace. Mm -hmm. uh, Did you folks have any children, you and Gloria? No. She had a daughter when we got married. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's, that was, uh, uh, that was all. And uh, how long were you married? Or did we were married for I think it was either 11 or 12 years. Did she, uh, did you get divorced or did she? Yeah, we got divorced. Uh-huh. Yeah. I see. Yeah, we got divorced. Uh, my, uh, So you sister, got divorced probably, uh, I would say, in the 1950s? Sounds about right, yeah. All right somewhere around 58 or something like that? I can't remember, but... Uh, 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 I can't remember, but we li we bought a... I bought a house first... When we first got married, we lived in Cheviot, uh right there on the corner of uh, Harrison, And uh, Davis, I think it was. Anyway, we lived upstairs, and then I had the furniture store later on in, in that building. But we lived upstairs. Uh, I don't know how long that happened. But then we had a Great Dane, and uh, the Great Dane had something with its back leg called Korea or something like that. And I took it to that 
and he couldn't do anything. So we took it to a chiropractor over in Western in, in Price Hill, and uh, they put a cast on it. And finally, we had to put it down, but uh, ended up before we did that, bought a house out in the Bridgetown Road, about a mile past Dog Trot. It had five acres of ground. And at that time, I had the furniture store. And uh, I started raising Great Danes then. Oh, did you? I had about five big ones. And then they'd have puppies and I'd sell them. Sometime they'd sell for $150. And I'd go down on Wednesday <coughs> when the store was closed at 1, I'd go down to Rain's Meat Packing and I'd buy about 50 pounds of jaw meat, uh, liver, all kind of ends of meat. and. Then I had a grinder, and we grind it up, make meatloafs for the dogs. Mm -hmm. I put uh, celery and carrots in it, and uh, I freeze it, and I have it for the week. So, so after you and Gloria got divorced, uh, what what did you do with yourself? Well, for about two years, I I uh, lived at that house by myself. You know, we had a swimming pool. I was building swimming pools at that time. Oh, you were? Yeah. Uh -huh. These were Esther Williams pools. And uh, something happened. That tree blew, blew down and had a big hole, made a lot of water, and it ended up, uh, I went to a uh, trade show at the downtown Duke Energy, and they had uh, swimming pools for sale. And I talked to my neighbor next door, uh, he had two boys, and uh, we built my pool and his pool. They dig one hole my day, and then dig his the next. And we got into the swimming pool business. We sold about 25 of them, and then we decided to get out of that business. So, I see. But, uh, it's still got the pool out there on Bridgetown Road. Uh, both of them are still there. Are, was out there a couple times since. Uh, the uh, my brother-in-law, was your glorious brother, he would come up and visit from Florida and stay, and he used to love to build things around the pool. And he built the big building with a bar, and we put a refrigerator in it. And on, on the side of the house, and then he built another uh, thing for a dressing room mm -hmm. and a place for the filter and all that stuff. So, but uh, his name was Reeves, Johnny, John Reeves the third, and he borrowed money all the time, never to pay it back. Uh, <laughs> anyway, he did fix up the yard real nice. Yeah. Um, so you're single at that time, right? And after, yeah. so, uh, and do you have the furniture store all this time too? Uh, yeah, pretty much so. Mm -hmm. It's furniture store for about forty some years. I see. Uh, and your second wife was was who? Bonnie Lou. Bonnie Lou, and what was, uh, was Bonnie Lou uh, her real name? No, her real name was uh, Mary Joanne Kath, K-A-T-H, and uh, she was a singer in Kansas City when she was younger. She was about 15, she was on KNBC, and her name was Sally Carson then. And she said she used to crawl up to the microphone. She was a yodeler. And she sent a copy of her singing. She met somebody on a train or a bus and sent it to uh, Cincinnati WLW. And uh, they hired her uh, on a Midwestern hayride and Paul Dixon's show. And she did Ruth Lyons' show, the Vivian Delacasa's show. And uh, she'd go around, and she loved to sing and entertain. She'd do shows all over town. 
How old was she when, he, when she came to Cincinnati? I don't remember, but she was probably, uh, she was a year and a half older than me. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Um, uh, so when did, when did she change her name and why? Well, she came, uh, way I understand it, she came to uh, Cincinnati as Sally Carson, but Bill McCluskey hired her and he wanted a, uh, he was from Scotland, he wanted a Bonnie, so he changed her name to Bonnie Lou. That's how she became Bonnie Lou. Uh -huh. and, uh, and she was famous for yodeling at that time? Yeah. Is that correct? Uh-huh. Yeah. That's, if I understand, she was probably about less than 20. Mm-hmm. But uh, she was able to get out of a Kansas City contract, she said, because when they, she signed it, she was underage. So they was able to some way hire her, and they hired her for $50 a week for Paul Dixon show. So when, when did you meet Bonnie Lou? Well, my lawyer was Cal Prim, and his wife was Lee Prim, and she was on the hayride with Bonnie. And she fixed me up with Bonnie. We had gone out to dinner a couple times, and I was carrying her guitar and banjo for her to do shows, and uh, that's how we met. Through, through Lee, Lee and Cal Prim. And how long? They, live, they lived on South Road, off of South Road in Bridgetown. Right. Uh, they had a big plot of ground back there, and it was hit bad by the tornado. And when I had the furniture store, I sent my truck out there, and I'm in to help clear all the debris and the, the trees and things that, that their, their home was totaled. The tornado just, luckily they were in the stairway going down the basement, her and her son. Wow. When did you and uh, Bonnie Lou get married? Uh, well, you mean what year? Mm -hmm. uh, can't remember, we were married, I'm trying to remember. Uh, Where'd you get married at? We got married in a synagogue in Roselong. Uh, I can't remember the name of it now. It was Temple something, Rose, Temple Shalom or something like that. Mm -hmm. And you recall what year that was? Uh, we were married for 50, Two or three years. When did uh, when did Bonnie Lou pass away? It's been on December the eighth last year, I think it was, or two years ago. Can't remember. A year or two ago. Okay, so and you were married fifty years. Fifty, I think it was fifty three or fifty two years. So that would uh, you would have gotten married somewhere around nineteen sixty seven, sixty eight. Something like sixty. Yeah. In the 60s sometime. Right. Yeah. yeah. Not sure, but uh, it's hard to remember all that anymore. Lucky right. I can remember my own name. Yeah. Uh, Brian, do you uh, have some questions for us, please? There are a couple. <laughs> Milt, um, you mentioned that your, your, I guess your, your family was originally from Russia. Your last name is Okum. Was it, do you know, was it was that shortened from something like a Russian name? Uh, well, I know my my dad signed it uh, uh, when he signed the uh, papers from the coming over. Uh, it was originally the rest of his brothers at OKUN, and he put an extra loop on it, but he didn't know how to write very well, and it became Oakum. Okay. And you mentioned that you had a, a brother who also 
served in World War II, right? He was in the Air Corps. Is he older than you? He was old, seven years older than me. Uh, we weren't very close because uh, he was in the service and then I was in the service and we just didn't get really close together. But he was in the Air Corps and he served in uh, California. He was training uh, radio operators in the Air, Air Force, but he never did go overseas. And he, he became, came back and he was a pharmacist. He owned uh, his own pharmacies, you know. First he was a manager, Shapiro Drugs and the Crew Tower, and then and the other one, uh, he was manager of that one too. And then he had his own drugstore on Highland Avenue. That was a, they had one in Hyde Park for a while, a drugstore, I remember that, on the corner, Erie Avenue, Madison. Now you, you mentioned that you were, when you went to UC, you were pre-med. What, what was your interest in, in medicine? Well, my family wanted me to be something like a dentist or a doctor. And I was in pre-med. That's only, you know, like, uh, you don't get very much in the doctoring. It's mostly learning uh, chemistry and Latin and all that kind of stuff. I didn't get into that very often. I, I, mean, I wasn't in it too long. and you were being trained as a medic, where, where were they training you at? Which, which place were you at when you were getting... Uh, my basic training? For, for, to be a medic, was that also a basic training? Oh. Uh, was that at Fort McClellan where you Fort got McClellan, basic Alabama, training Alabama, for uh -huh. the medic yeah. also? Fort McClellan, uh, Alabama. That's where you did your basic, right? Yeah, uh-huh. Is that also where you they trained you to be a medic? Uh, yeah, I had just a short time. It was like uh, maybe eight hours. <laughs> Teach you how to use sulfur drugs and how to turn the tourniquet and stop bleeding and a couple of things, you know, mm -hmm. nothing. Well, how did you find out the news that you were going to be a medic? Do you remember that? How that happened? Uh, like, did you sign up for it? Did you just no, they just it? they just have signed you to it. They just said, "Oh, you were you see med school." I was only there maybe what a week or two. <laughs> they, we're gonna we'll put you in the veteran, and you know they were pretty organized. They just said, "This is where you go." <laughs> and when you arrived in. in uh, in France, by boat, when you arrived there, was that already, uh, was it still winter or was it springtime yet at that point? That was about in April. That okay. was, uh, we, uh, Camp Lucky Strike, it was in La Havre. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, about, about the first part of April. What, what was your impressions of Camp Lucky? What was what? Your impressions of Camp Lucky. Do you have any memories of what Camp Lucky was like? Or were you... Not too much, because it was only there for a short time. Uh, we weren't there very long. They, they put us in those uh, freight cars. They called them 40 and 8s. And we were heading towards uh, Brussels, and they blew out a bridge in front of the train and backed it up and then we went through Luxembourg and down into Mannheim where I what, was it, what was it like to travel in those uh in the in the you just piled in there with guys there was, no there was 40 guys put in one car and you were packed in like a sardine and when somebody had to go to the bathroom you'd hold his hands they'd open up the door a little bit and he'd hang his butt out or whatever and 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 then we'd see French people and we'd wave to them 
I can remember we didn't know any French, but we'd say, barnyard manure, barnyard manure. <laughs> that was our French words for <laughs> but <laughs> crazy. Uh, did you have a chance to, 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 do, uh, to be a medic? Did you treat anybody? Yeah, I, I was a medic on a couple guys, and uh, we would uh, stop the bleeding, send them back to the uh, or, or headquarters, wherever the hospital was supposed to be set up. And then uh, I didn't do any surgery or nothing like that, but they were shooting at me, and that's when I took the bandage off, Red Cross off my arm, and I said, I, I need to have a gun, you know, and they gave me a rifle and put me in the front line. So when you were, when you had, when you were being shot at, where was that? Was that still in Belgium? Or? No, that was uh, right around, uh, I'm trying to remember where that was. It was right before Heidelberg. Cause, oh, so in Germany, right? Yeah. It was, I remember we had to dig a trench that night before, like a foxhole. And they were bombing all around us. Uh, airplanes were dropping stuff. And, and uh, we got, in the morning, we got uh, on these tanks. We sat on the tanks, uh, went across the pontoon. They built across the water to get across up into Heidelberg. And we sat in uh, on the back of those to get across. Now you were getting, this is getting near the end of the war. Did you have people who were, uh, did you have to take a prisoners of war? Did you have people who were surrendering to you or anything like that? Yeah, well, well at one time we got this group of guys in white uniforms, all dressed in white, uh, like doctors. They came around the corner waving handkerchiefs, white handkerchiefs, and they surrendered. And they were the Werner von Braun group of scientists. And we sent them back to uh, headquarters, and they ended up going to Mexico, uh, Los Alamos, New Mexico. One of them was, I, said, I was told it was a guy by the name Oppenheimer. And they, they invented the atomic bomb, which actually uh, probably saved my life because they bombed Tokyo and those Nagasaki and stuff. That's what I was going to ask. Did you do, we, after, after the uh, Germans had surrendered, were you hearing that you might be getting shipped to the Pacific Theater? Uh, I didn't have to go, uh, fortunately. I uh, didn't have to go because uh, they sent me down to San Antonio. And that's, that's uh, But I was just wondering if that time after the Germans had surrendered and you were still there, were, there, were you hearing any rumors that you might be shipped out to, to the Pacific? A lot of our guys w were shipped out. Part of the outfit was divided up. You know, uh, part of them went to the Pacific yet. I, I didn't have to go. I was, at that time, I was uh, doing some other kind of uh, job. Uh, I think it was either doing typing or final orientation. Uh, it was one of my jobs down there. Did you uh, go into Heidelberg? Did, did I what? Did you go into the town of Heidelberg at all? Uh, I didn't go into the town, but I sat on a tank and we went through it. I yeah. was wondering, did it get much destruction? What was it? What was your memories of? of uh... Well, all I could see was the buildings on the side of the highway, or a big wall, and the buildings up above it. I couldn't. We didn't get in town to see it. Did you? Uh, after the Germans had surrendered, did you have much uh, contact with German civilians or anything like with the uh, much interaction with uh, the German people? 
Not that I can remember, no. Oh, uh, don't think so. Um, did you ever uh, run into any, any uh, top brass people, any officers or anything like that? <laughs> did I what? Did you run into any uh, top brass people or anything, like big time generals or anything? Did you see anybody like that over there? I saw Dwight Eisenhower one time when I was San Antonio. He come by when I was doing a final orientation, and I saluted him. He saluted me back, and that's it. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. I remember him. Uh, um, I'm going to work a couple of questions about your civilian life, but maybe you mentioned this because I, I had to step out for a second. But how did you, uh, how did it come about that you opened your furniture store? Did you mention that already? Well, I had the fruit store and my friend had a furniture store. He was working at his uncle's place in Norwood called uh, Plants in Norwood. And we'd go out to dinner and he had mentioned he sold a dinette set and made like $35 before it came to dinner. I said, gee whiz, I'm certain these strawberries uh, at a nickel a quart, trying to get an extra quart out of a crate. And uh, I'm thinking, I'm in the wrong business. So I look in the paper and there's this furniture store in Shiviet was in the uh, at that time, it was a bowling alley, Walsh's bowling alley, and a furniture store was called Horner. And I had, a, I had the paper for sale, so I went in and talked to him, and his wife said, every time somebody would come in, he'd uh, break out in a sweat. And so I said, well, I took out a 90-day note on the furniture store, and uh, they left town, and I learned how to sell furniture. I, I'd open up catalog of appliances and show the people how to, you know, on the back of the catalog page, it explained how many shelves it had, how their square feet and all that, and I'd read it all to them, and that's how I learned. They learned, and they, they appreciated that. And I'd look in the back, and it said retail for 179 and this is what it cost, how much you want to pay? And they'd make a price, and I said, well, that sounds pretty good. And then we made a deal. And one, they'd send more people in. And that's how it got started. Uh, they, they, they recommend friends, and uh, I was used to making a nickel in a box of strawberries. I was making dollars on refrigerators. <laughs> so they made a, and I had a little boy work for me. He, I'm trying to remember his name now. Uh, he had a little pickup truck, and I bought a pickup truck. And we used to deliver stuff. Uh, after four o'clock, we go out and deliver our merchandise to people. And then uh, I moved into where the bingo hall is for a while. And then I moved up to where the next corner was. I lived upstairs, and then I ended up buying the Woolworth uh, Time Store building in Cheviot. That's where Capitals is now. And uh, it was for sale. And uh, I had to pay uh, every month three checks. I had one to somebody by the name of Collier and one to Peterson, or Peters, and another one was to the, the guy that owned the building. I can't remember his name now, but anyway, I finally I had a 15-year loan, and I paid it off. And then uh, had that building for a long time. We, we advertised uh, our furniture Prices were born here and raised elsewhere. That's good. That's yeah. good. Hey, 
think we have different sayings. Now, you were you were married to Bonnie Lou, who was a pretty pretty well known entertainer, TV personality here in town. Did you ever get her to help advertise or plug? Oh, oh yeah, she did it. She did a lot of advertising with me. We did it. I got some DVDs uh, that I made with her, and, and, I, and we did for the furniture store. And then we'd always, at the end of it, we'd always say, we'd love to see you. And that was our, our, our ending of it. And people uh, that we'd see on the street, or I'd see them maybe on the other side of the golf course, they'd wave and say, we'd love to see you, you know. It was a good, good motto. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah, Bonnie, she did. We did commercials together, and I got them on those DVDs uh, uh, that I had made copies for you. Uh, and a couple of them, I did the magic, you know, I put the needle through the balloon, and then I pop it. And, I was going to ask about that. Now you're. You're also known as Magical Milk. I was wondering uh, how that how that became into your life, magic, and uh, how you did your magic act. Well, I used to go with Bonnie to do entertaining, and we would be on the Mississippi Queen and the Delta Queen, and Royal Caribbean, and we do shows. We get the trip free, and I had to carry her banjo and guitar. So while we were in Florida, we had a condo there first and then I got home, uh, belonged to a magic club and I got to do, learn how to do magic and that came in handy when she would need a, a break from singing. I could get up and do a couple of magic things and uh, give her a chance to uh, rest her voice and it worked out pretty well. Now, I think that when Paul Dixon died, I guess in the early 70s, didn't she kind of retire from television? But she kept doing appearances sometimes, didn't she? Or did uh, she Paul, I was wondering if Bonnie helped out on the store after she kind of yeah, got away from doing regular TV. Uh, well, she, for a couple of years, her and Colleen did the show, you know. Uh, Paul Baby. Colleen Murray. Or, uh, I don't know if you remember her or not. Colleen Sharp. Sharp. Um, mm -hmm. Her last name was Sharp Murray. She married uh, Sharp Murray. Uh, but Bonnie and her carried the show for a while. And then I think it was just stopped. Uh, but Bonnie did shows for Ruth Lyons and she did uh, Vivian Delacasa and she had done the hayride. But after she did television, wasn't she still occasionally do shows around town or out, well, out somewhere? And I thought, didn't you used to sort of, I don't know if you meet her manager, but I think, didn't you handle some of her? Yeah, I carried her banjo and guitar and did magic in between. <laughs> yeah, but we, we, got, we got a lot of uh, free trips on the Mississippi Queen. It was on it about 11 times was on Delta Queen about 10, and we did shows. Uh, or she sing and I do some magic, and, and uh, it worked out pretty well. You know, got to see a lot. We did uh, a couple. Got to go to Hawaii one time. Uh, doing I took a group of people, and uh, we were the escorts. We went to a couple other places, Shanghai and uh, Hong Kong one time. Uh, trying to remember all the different trips that we had. Well, you mentioned that you would do some reunions with, with uh, people you knew from the military. When did you start doing that? Doing what? Going, going to reunions for uh, from the military. Oh, you mean our, our outfit reunions? Yeah, when did you start doing that? Uh, I don't remember when I started, but I only went to a few of them. Uh, they were, one of them was in Indianapolis, one of them was uh, 
uh, that's a round towner over in Kentucky. Uh, they they have them quite often, but I, I was brought in, wasn't able to travel for a while, so we did, we quit going. But uh, she had macular with her eyes; she couldn't see very well because uh, her eyes were failing her because of the smoking, and uh, and she gained a lot of weight, and it was hard for her to get around. Did you and Bonnie have any children? No, but she has a daughter, and uh, her daughter' name was Connie, and Connie is uh, living in Santa Barbara, California now. Her husband, Ed, he uh, owned uh, about seven McDonald's, uh, and I hear from her about twice a year. Uh, I email her, but she don't return emails back. But uh, I, uh, she's doing pretty good. Uh, they've, they're building a new house, Santa Barbara, mm -hmm. and they still got their house in Indian Hill for sale. If you're interested, anybody want to buy it? They make you a good deal on it. It's got a swimming pool and. Wasn't uh, Bonnie Lou her, her first husband? Wasn't he also World War II? Wasn't he a, uh, yeah. a veteran? Yeah, his name was uh, Glenn Ewens, and uh, he was killed in an automobile accident before we met. Uh, and he was from Illinois, and his parents uh, owned the bank in uh, Carlock. And one time Bonnie said she came home and uh, uh, these guys followed her and they put a gun there, wanted to know where her husband was. Uh, they wanted, because he came home all the time from the bank with the deposits before he put them in the safe. And uh, she wouldn't tell him. And he was hiding in the closet. But she never did tell him. That's, that was, that's part of her interview. I got it on a disc that she interviewed one time. With her, her husband, do you know where he served at? Do you know much about his, his uh, service? Did she ever, I she don't, ever talk about that much? She never talked about it, no. Because I always thought she told me one time that he, he was kind of shell-shocked or something. I don't know. You know, I never heard that. I, I know he got killed in an automobile accident. Yeah. 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 I just I had the impression that he had some... You know, the, uh, it, you know, I never did meet him, so I don't I have any idea. Right. And she never mentioned it. So it's, I don't really know. Uh, so are you, are you doing anything uh, other than honor flight? Have you been involved in any kind of veteran uh, activities or anything? Uh, where? Uh, veteran, veteran stuff at all, other than honor flight? Have you? been involved with anything like uh, oh. any other ceremonies or something? Well, we went to all the different uh, memorials. I didn't do anything as far as entertaining or nothing. Is that what you mean? Well, I just wonder if you've done, gone to any other, you know, Veterans um, Affairs or any yeah. any Veterans Affairs. Do you, do oh, you have I gone that? to any? Yeah. Okay. Uh, nothing lately, no. Uh, I did meet at the honor flight, I met some people uh, that uh, one guy used to work for me, and uh, I forgot his name, but he gave me it, and I wrote it down, and I sent him some DVDs of Bonnie and that. But he said he used to uh, have to take Bonnie to work for me one time. I didn't remember uh, I asked him to do that, but things like that. But, uh, uh, the honor flight was quite a great, uh, awesome trip because they had uh, all the memorials that we visited, and uh, it was they had the bagpipes playing when we came in and got out. And uh, what else? It was just everybody shaking your hand, and it was just quite a uh, awesome trip. Well, that's all the questions I can think of, though. So thank you. What's that? That's all the questions I can think of. Good. <laughs> well, I, we're at 
at the end of our interview, Milton, uh, I want to take this time to thank you for allowing us to have this interview. And oh. I wanted to also thank you uh, for being a patriot and your service <laughs> to our country. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate thank it. Thank you, sir. It's very, very honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you.